Hey, David, welcome to the interview. We're really happy to have you. Do you want to give us a quick introduction about yourself, uh, plug your social media and other projects that uh, you're working on right now? Uh, hey, my name's David Sliger. I'm a policy analyst. I live in Sydney, Australia. I've worked for some federal and state labor ministers, uh, treasury departments, finance departments, and that sort of thing. I uh, ride on social and economic policy. I'm planning to start a social democratic welfare state short course. Um, so you guys should hopefully sign up for that. Um, and uh, I'll be starting a podcast myself. So that's absolutely perhaps excellent. a think tank, perhaps a think tank. Oh, see yeah, how it goes. We're, we're really excited for that. I mean, I think you're, uh, you and James Medlock were probably one of the first people that I was reading when I was kind of entering this kind of realm of social democracy and kind of evidence and policy-based leftism. So it's, it's like, it's really surreal to have you here and to be talking to you. I'm really excited uh, for the kind of conversation that we're going to get into. Really happy to Thanks, have you. Thanks, mate. I, I really appreciate it. And it, it. It's really nice to hear that, like, you know, people across the world are getting into this stuff. And it's, it, it's really inspiring, actually, to see so many young people on, on Twitter, like, getting really into the welfare state and social democracy when i was young when i was in my teens and 20s it just there just wasn't a movement like that mm. so I, I really like you know it's really good to see yeah and it, yeah it's, it's great to you know uh, like i've had a really excellent people on the podcast so far so it's really uh, nice to have you know people who are much more knowledgeable than me, than me on here and just to talk these things through and i think it's we're it's really nice see this kind of incipient movement on its rise. So I'm, I'm again, so I'm really excited to do this. So why don't we get into it? So you're a, a you know policy analyst, you're an expert on the welfare state. So uh, one of the things that you wanted to talk about, and we talked a little bit about this before you know we started recording, um, was this uh, like idea of the typification of the welfare state. So the, the book that we both you know love is Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism, where the author uh, goes to Esprit Anderson, lays out these kind of like three structures for welfare states, uh, which, you know, the liberal, conservative and social democratic one. But you also argue that, uh, you know, Australia and New Zealand in its own sense are meaningfully kind of distinct type. So do you kind of want to go through what these three welfare states are and then how uh, Australia and New Zealand are like sufficiently distinctive from them? Uh, yeah, sure. So, well, Esping Anderson in his Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism um, put together three different broad um, schemes of welfare state. Now, I, I think I see a lot of people online getting hung up about whether these are some kind of three uh, kind of ultimate states of the welfare system that all welfare systems will evolve to or, or, mm -hmm. or, or whether there are more models of the welfare state and so on. I, that's not really the way I look at it. I think he, I mean, any classification system, I think, is somewhat arbitrary in that you can, there's multiple dimensions and they're more spectrum than dichotomous in nature and you can slot one country um, people argue for different schemes and different countries slotting into different it's all a little bit it's all a little bit arbitrary on some level but I think the the story that um, Esping Anderson told the three model story is a very useful one in terms of um, the kind of small um, selectivist uh, liberal model, which was um, prominent in English speaking countries with, with, although Australia and New Zealand are sort of a special, historically a special case of that, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, the continental conservative tradition, which was which is largely about um, reinforcing um, traditional social institutions such as the family, such as uh, employment and so on, um, because people establish welfare, their eligibility for welfare based on their family status, based on by going through the breadwinner of the family, based on their workforce participation, their workforce 
contributions and so on. And then the, um, um, the Nordic social democratic model, which is universal, universalist in nature. And the goal for those, for those countries in the Esping Anderson story is um, that everyone gets eligibility for a scheme just by being a citizen. Um, and, and, and then he, he tells a story about that, helping to build social solidarity behind the welfare state, or at least maximizing its political appeal. And he also tells a story about the way these um, welfare institutions build up in a symbiotic relationship with full employment. And he 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 tells he tells a nice story about how these two forces can operate together to reinforce each other and as a problem with full employment um, emerges you deal with it via a welfare state solution and so on and um, I I really I really like the way he talks about the universalist uh, social democratic systems because in 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 the in the welfare state field, we don't really have any great treatises. We don't we don't have um, we don't have the Communist Manifesto, or we don't have the Wealth of Nations, because the welfare state was something that was emergent um, largely without very prescriptive theory. It was. Um, it was social movements responding to social problems that presented themselves with the advent of industrialized capitalism. So there was always this kind of um, ad hoc um, unions, bureaucrats, politicians, social, social statistics people kind of just kind of making things up as they go along. But, uh, but I think the good what I really like about Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism is the way he brings it together into a nice coherent story about the sort of society that a universalistic um, social democratic welfare system can provide, which um, deals with both with the, uh, a, a socialistic side um, in terms of uh, liberating people to some extent from the market, it has a egalitarian side in terms of any universalistic welfare system can, combined with high taxation is going to result in a lot of redistribution. And also a liberal side, the good parts of liberalism in terms of individual autonomy and the ability to self-actualize and be free of traditional social institutions, such as um, such as the family, you, you're not dependent on the family. The, 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 the government directs payments to individuals to help liberate people from traditional social sources that uh, non-workers or desperate people would go to, like their families or extended families, churches, and so on. And in, in that way, it, it contributes to freedom. Absolutely. Um, Sorry, that did, I, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was just, I was just wondering, yeah, like how, like if we could, you know, let's let's uh, go into like the, you know, the distinctiveness of the Australian and uh, New Zealand, yeah, uh, yeah. kind of uh, welfare state compared to the three, which I think you did, you know, it's a great breakdown of three worlds of welfare capitalism. You did the start. I really, um, I would recommend anybody listening to read that book because it is. You're absolutely right. It is like one of the only treatises we do have as social democrats. You know, you know, socialists get the Communist Manifesto, liberals get the, you know, the, the wealth of nations. But you know, this is this is a really important and seminal work that we should be reading. I mean, I think we probably need a we need another one. I mean, the dramatic Absolutely. irony of the three worlds of welfare capitalism is that Sweden is kind of the hero of the story. And he's writing it in 1990, and right, they just went like literally on basically on the eve of him writing that book, Sweden just collapses with the um, uh, the, the recession and yeah. they lost a lot of ground and their model kind of 
uh, and it collapsed. Yeah, their model kind of collapsed. I mean, it, it's still a good, it's still a good welfare state, but that beautiful interaction of um, um, full employment and huge welfare um, mm -hmm. fell over. And I mean, I, we just need more analysis about what went wrong and how do we get it back. I, and mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think people really have. Uh, great stories about that but in, in any case it's a uh, uh I, I i would also clarify three worlds of welfare capitalism i see people getting hung up on uh, on the stats and whether they can prove um selectivist regimes are mm -hmm. less popular or whatever which i think they are but a lot of that stuff is just very hard to prove and the 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 data, I, I kind of skip over the data in three worlds of welfare capitalism. It, it was it was sound for its time, but mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of the methods have moved on and that kind of like running regressions of things that you just slot in a box mm -hmm. is, is a little bit is a little bit problematic. So I like yeah. it more for its story than yeah. the than the than the data. But I mean one of the one of the issues that uh, has been raised about three worlds of welfare capitalism um, is, and it's, it's generally agreed, I think, in, in a lot of the literature is that from a social democratic perspective, um, it's a little bit harsh on Australia and New Zealand. It, it mm -hmm. doesn't quite, um, it doesn't quite capture the way that they are distinctive from the United States. Yeah. Um, now, Australia. Yeah, um, yeah this, this is a good point to jump into. Like the second question is like, how are they? How are they distinctive in Australia, and New Zealand, and like, what yeah. what is the kind of story that's underlying it, and how that differentiated differentiates itself from the three that uh, we were just talking about? Yeah. So uh, one of the top um, welfare state scholars, uh, probably the top in the English speaking world, I would say, is a is a a, a guy named. Francis Castles of the Australian National University. He's, he's retired now, but he was he was actually an influence. They he influenced Esping Anderson, and there was mutual influence. And he convinced Esping Anderson that the Australian and New Zealand model was distinct from the rest of the English speaking Anglo countries. And the first. The first point I would say is that there's a problem which Esping Anderson knows him notes himself in Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism of just looking at um, overall levels of social spending, for example. Australian and United States social spending looks pretty similar. In fact, Australia, Australia's social spending now is lower than the United lower than the United States. It's around 16 percent of GDP, public social spending, um, whereas eight, US is about 18.7, I think. I, um, I think that's right. Um, but you've got to look at the components of that and US social spending is largely their kind of deranged healthcare system. Um, <laughs> that's the best description it, it, I've ever heard of it. Uh, you know, um, also, um, Australia does actually take that targeting, poor targeting ideal mm -hmm. to, to its kind of logical extreme almost, and it genuinely does follow through, at least historically, it's the, there are problems now, but at least historically, there was an effort to actually direct the money that was spent to the most needy, to to the people who um, passed some kind of means test. Um, that was all the way through its um, all the way through its social system. Um, whereas the, the US is not actually particularly poor targeted, like social security is not um, nothing like as targeted as 
most of the Australian payment system. Um, and th they have, for a lot of the very poor in the United States, they have absolutely nothing. Like for a long-term unemployed single person, um, you know, if once your unemployment insurance runs out, which you might not even be eligible for, mm -hmm. or even if you are, it might run out after three months. There's nothing, nothing. Whereas the Australian unemployment benefit, it's uh, <laughs> it's pretty poor in a lot of ways, but you can you can get it forever. Um, and and we don't we went the other way. Whereas the US has a um, income replacement um system for a short mm. period and and the best the best of the best countries have both which is a income replacement and then a flat a, a lower flat level forever australia the us only has the income replacement which is compared to a low flat level relatively pro wealthy although it's still a good thing to do um whereas australia went the other way and it's just got that low flat level but i mean the Australian system at its best, um, and it, it's a long way, it's kind of reverted into a lot of the normal liberal model now, but those low payments were conceived of as a social right. So um, mm -hmm. you, you, you can, you, when, when you think of targeting, when you think of selectivist welfare policy, and this is the thing that S. Bing Anderson hates, and you know I, I I don't like it either. But you can conceptually, but you can divide that into two groups. You can divide that into um, a kind of puritanical, moralistic, punitive approach, like the old workhouses where you you make where you select people by making them jump through all these complex hoops and make them do a drug test, make them, you know, do 30 workfare hours and, mm -hmm. and so on. Or you can say it's selective in the sense that automatically, if, if, if your income falls below a certain level, you automatically get the payment if you watch the fall. And that, that's not mm -hmm. something we should neglect either. But it is... It is, while means testing, which is the centrepiece of the Australian and New Zealand system, no country does means testing as much as Australia. It's across the entire system and it is the most means tested regime in the world. Um, but but a, a means test is nowhere near as uh, kind of morally problematic as that more punitive side of targeting. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, um, the Australian system was designed. So we were the third country in the world to get a non-contributory pension, age pension. And that, that was New Zealand and Vic um, that was New South Wales and Victoria in 1900. New Zealand was the second country who got it a couple of years beforehand and the first country was Denmark and that was although it was means tested that was designed deliberately mm -hmm. to be a social right to be a social right to a minimum standard of living that people didn't have to uh, prove their moral uh, merit for that it was not contingent on any notion of deserving or undeserving. And uh, 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 as put um, a Labor politician around 1900 in New South Wales who helped um, introduce it said, um, it should be conceived of as a free gift from the state in recognition mm. of services rendered to it. The pension should be conceived of as a right, not as a pauper doll. Mm -hmm. And that was generally, for for much of the 20th century, the philosophy behind um, the Australian welfare regime. Um, and, and yet, but almost mechanically, the mm. way Esping Anderson um, analyzes decommodification and 
um, analyzes social right because there is that because it's not universal because there is an aspect of selectivity in there in the sense that you've got to be below he just scores he just scores Australia really low for anything for everything but um, that is very that is that is very different to the kind of punitive workhouse system and it was de designed with that in mind so um i would i would say that's the first um significant problem with how esping anderson treats australia and new zealand it's 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 not sensitive to the distinctive system that did develop here where it, it was conceived of as not universal, but still not universal payment, but a universal social right to be to to a minimum standard of living. And Australia at that Australia and New Zealand at that time, I mean, we were alongside Denmark. We were regarded as at the frontier, at the frontier of egalitarian uh, wealth of the egalitarian welfare system. Also. Mm -hmm the labour market. And that's because uh, Australia and New Zealand, along with the Nordic countries, had for much of the, from, from the late 19th century into much of the 20th century, had, all of the countries had pretty similar, similarly strong um, labour movements. They're all basically at the frontier of the world. So a, a lot of positive changes and, and, and egalitarian slanted changes were happening in Australia. Now, you know, Germany, Germany gets credit. They, they, were, they were there earlier for social insurance, but you can see that, that that is a conservative model. People had to establish eligibility. People had to work. People had to contribute. It was not a free gift. It was not egalitarian. The more you made, the, the, bigger, the bigger pension you got. Mm -hmm. uh, the, Denmark, New Zealand, Australian model was designed as a right and, and as an egalitarian payment where everyone had a minimum standard. And most people had that minimum standard. Some of the you know, wealthy were kind of means tested out. Um, and Australia was relatively, had a very comprehensive system of um, um, workers compensation as well we were we were we were near the frontier on that mm -hmm. and, and and good um sickness leave from employers but th there are some ways that esping anderson does his calculations for example he immediately downgrades basically puts australia at the bottom because it, there is a selectivist um component to it but you know as we've been through although I think means tested welfare is a is a less elegant and less kind of uh, social democratic and spirit, spirit model if it is there as as, as a, a genuine guaranteed minimum it it is very it is a social right in some sense and in arguably it is more than the the model's you see that a contingent on family and workforce participation in the continental conservative countries, but you know, <laughs> he still puts Australia at the bottom. I mean, Australia, I, I, I remember reading it, and it pretty much gets close to the bottom of every score in the book. And there's one I think, um, I think it's sickness, I think it's sickness benefits where it's a combination of just a mathematical error, like literally he added up his calculations wrong. Happy to mm -hmm. find a reference for that for, for, for the listeners. But also he, um, he, 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 he didn't, he didn't um, you know, Australia made employers contribute things like sick leave and, rather than uh, pay for it via the government or, or there was an interaction between the two. And his model wasn't very sensitive to the way that um, things could be pushed onto employers. And that, that, that's, a, that's a second big part 
of the Australian welfare model. Um, Australia, the Australian welfare model is, at least in the, for much of the 20th century, a mix of low um, guaranteed minimums for eligible categories, mm -hmm. your unemployment, Australia is fairly slow getting unemployment benefits only in the 1940s, um, unemployment, um, uh, aged, disability, and so on, but a relatively generous system of employer requirements. Um, and you can you can understand that it, it, you can understand that I like to think of that as an adaptation to a very specific situation that Australia mm -hmm. found itself in, which is that we had one of the most powerful labour movements in the world for the first just about the first eighty years of the twentieth century and prior to that in the nineteenth century, but. Unlike the Scandinavian countries, the Labor government just couldn't win. Mm -hmm. so, they, were, they were never able to form government, right? If I oh no 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 it. sorry sorry no no to be no clarify they they certainly did win. Um, huh. They uh, a Labor government in New South Wales established the age pension. Then yeah. federally, uh, a Labor government established the federal age pension. Mm -hmm. Um, basically, Labor built the welfare state such that it, it existed. But they were, I mean, they were, they were in, they just, they just have never been in power for a particularly long period. I mean, mm -hmm. the longest uh, Labor have ever been in power was uh, in the 80s to 90s for about, uh, about 13 years. And prior to that, they were in power for a, a a, a, a few years here and there um mm -hmm. and 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 then the they're in power from about 1941 to uh 1949 where they built a lot of the welfare state mm -hmm. okay. but Mm -hmm. But but then they were out of power for twenty three years, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and 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 some people, um, and 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 in that time the welfare welfare it, it was pretty good when they left. That's the interesting thing. At various points in Australian history, the welfare was pretty good. Like that first age pension that was set up, um, all the way into the nineteen forties, that held up as one of the highest basic rate levels of pension in the world. Um, but then, then 23 years of conservative rule, the value eroded. Um, they didn't, they didn't um, adjust it for prices. And, and, and by the end of that, Australia had one of the lowest, I think it was the lowest cash welfare spend of any country in the OECD mm -hmm. um, other than Japan by about, we're talking around 1970. Have to, have to um, mm -hmm. check that exactly, but around very close, that, that's approximately correct, even lower than the US. Mm -hmm. um, so but, I, I, you know, uh -huh. but, 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 at the, but, but at the same time, so Labor could never go that extra step. So, mm -hmm. so people like to trash the Labor Party in Australia. And, you know, you know, most centre-left parties, there's a lot of trashing you can do that's very fair. But uh, Australia, the Labor Party did pretty aggressively build up the welfare state when they were in power. They didn't win. That was the problem. But there was a really powerful labor movement. So what do you do? What, what is just the logical way that mm -hmm. you respond to that? That is, you try to push as much welfare-like stuff into the industrial side uh -huh. of, um, you know. So they had strong workers' compensation. They had very, very high wages, um, high minimum wages. They had... In, in that they tried to even um, have this idea of uh, 
family based minimum wages so the family the, a family of five mm. was used mm -hmm. as the basis for the minimum wage and the intent of that was to allow people with different with, with larger household compositions to survive um so it was almost like that goes back to 1907 a very famous case called the harvester judgment um where he said you know really if we're talking the minimum wage we've got to look at how you know non-workers we've got to look at household dependence mm -hmm. and and there, there was a judge who was um you know presiding over the famous minimum wage dispute and from there, that, that set up the minimum wage system. And so we had high minimum wages designed to contribute to dependence, almost like a, 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 a child benefit scheme, yeah. but, you know, a bit, bit crap. Um, uh -huh. Although it did evolve into a ch proper child benefit scheme. Um, and and good, good, pretty good leave. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, these... uh, and, 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 and during the night, and from the eighties, uh, uh, employers were required to contribute to uh, private uh, retirement income schemes. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the welfare state was loaded up into the employment side of things, which mm -hmm. you know, which which sucks as a I would, from my perspective, but it's also the best you could do and and just from a kind of a basic math point you can't add up a a, a a you've you've got to kind of add up that employer provided welfare when you make comparisons the australian model had a at its best a a, a generous social right minimum combined with employer provision for the broader working and middle class on top of that and at various points you slap those two together and it was sort of okay it was sort of pretty good mm -hmm. even at some points um obviously there were there were people um that that didn't do well out of that like for much of the 20th century it was quite bad to women because uh, only men got that family component in their wage or you mm. know because if you if you're playing the family component via uh, uh, through wages you, mm -hmm. you, you can't double you can't double count it so you've got to say yeah. back historically well we'll only pay it to the men so uh -huh. that entrenched uh you know division uh mm -hmm. you know entrenched wage discrimination and yeah and 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 if you had limited connection to the labour market, if you were uh, disabled with limited connection to the labour market, and you know for for a lot of the history, if you weren't a white man, it it, it mm -hmm. was always very bad. Um, yeah. But you know, um, it, it's a more nuanced picture than what you get from reading Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism. As much as I like the book, yeah. No, that, that's, I think that's, a, that's an excellent breakdown of how it differs uh, from the kind of three tip implications. We, we, we've talked a fair bit about like the strength of this welfare, uh, this kind of welfare model, this kind of like means testing uh, on steroids, basically. Uh, like, but like what, what are, you know, what, what, what are the, the biggest weaknesses you see with this system, uh, with, with the kind of means testing that goes on? Yeah, um, so firstly, I, I would just, in terms of, backing that by some stats mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the highest um, uh, highest quintile to lowest quintile transfers uh, the Australian tax transfer system redistributes more um, per dollar this is the important thing to clarify per dollar mm -hmm. of redistribution the Australian system redistributes mm -hmm. more from the top to the bottom than any other scheme in the world and even the uh, the distribution from the top to the bottom is pretty good even in absolute terms mm -hmm. um or at least it was until the australian system in a whole lot of ways has gone into decline and it's it, it started to resemble increasingly resemble more like the classic liberal system um for a whole bunch of reasons 
um, the, the way that particular wage earner model as Australia did it required a, a bunch of historical forces that no longer exist. I mean, mm-hmm. to get all that employer welfare, you, you needed a really powerful union movement. And Australia's union movement is mm-hmm. now more like the United States than that of um, Denmark, <laughs> which historically was more like Denmark. Um, mm-hmm. You needed a <laughs> you needed that male breadwinner model. I mean, that's that is the only way you could really have uh, use the labour market to do household level welfare. If you say, well, you know, it can only go to one person in the mm-hmm. household. Otherwise, you're double dipping and it's all kinds of problems. <laughs> um, it requires it required a system of full employment mm-hmm. or very low unemployment, which no longer is no longer there. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 it I mean it'll you could argue that it, it does sort of <laughs> I'm not saying this is a scientifically valid way of looking at it, but it does sort of seem to support Esping Anderson's story on some mm-hmm. level, um, which is that if you don't build these nice universalistic um, systems, it will just fall over into, you know, crap, <laughs> you know, really uh-huh. kind of ungenerous, punitive, ungenerous Move and punitive. Towards more like, a, like an American liberal kind of marketized more, welfare yeah, system. Which yeah. is absolutely how Australia's moved. And, you know, uh-huh. it is small, you know, sample size of one or two in New Zealand's case. So, uh, I'm not. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not saying I can prove that, but to me, it rings. It does ring true, um, because one one of the things that um, Esping Anderson talked about was that if you don't, if you don't keep up with that, you know, big fat universalistic. Um, top tier welfare system, it's just going to be provided by the private sector anyway. Mm-hmm. And that is the that is exactly the way that Australia went. Because, because Australia could never get that constant winning for the Social Democratic Party and it was basically conservative regime. Firstly, mm-hmm. um, after so in, in the in the mid 1970s when a very kind of staunchly social socially democratic labor government got elected they put in um, you know public health insurance scheme the the next it was very controversial he was dismissed um, the Whitlam he was dismissed by the Queen's representative um, and uh, <laughs> a conservative mm-hmm. government took over, um, who literally just repealed the public healthcare system, and then and then they lasted a you know uh, till 1983, and Labor came back, and Labor came back and re-established uh, public health insurance. Um, at this time, the, the the conservative government were smart enough to know that that was a popular issue, um, the next Conservative government. So they never abolished it, but they did put all kinds of cost controls. And in John Howard, who was a Conservative, the, you know, the Liberal Party in Australia, which is the Conservative Party, mm-hmm. uh, John Howard, the Prime Minister, I think he called it public... Pub- no, uh, uh, it was Andrew Norton, who who is a... Um, kind of a libertarian scholar um, called John Howard's philosophy public plus, um, which was keep the public model, but just don't let it grow. And then um, have all introduce all kinds of tax subsidies for private insurance and basically push people through tax incentives um, or tax punishments and so on to go into the private system and Mm -hmm. no more starkly can you see that than um the than in retirement income policy in australia um Mm -hmm. in the 19 it, it did one of the interesting things that did happen in kind of mid mid 20th century australia is 
we did actually universalize our age pension mm -hmm. for a little while. We abolished the age pension assets test. And that was, that was successive. That was both Labor and Liberal did that. Then the um, Hawke Labor government came in and said, we will, um, you know, there's a cost sustainability problem here. And, you know, we want to target we want to better target this so they re-established um, assets testing. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens is, but at the same, like the same government established, and it was this was partly consistent with the wage earners model um, because it was kind of a deal with the a deal between the government and the union movement to control inflation. Um, they established large, by foregoing real pay increases um, in exchange for establishing these superannuation accounts, these kind of mm -hmm. privatized social, I think they call them 401ks in the US, but yeah. they're massive over here. And everyone, 10% of your wage goes into them if effectively. The employee mm -hmm. pays it. But, um, and um, so they established them. And on the other hand, the tax regime for that is massively regressive. So they're taxed. So effectively, it's like your wage goes into that, but they're taxed mm -hmm. at 15, they're taxed at flat 15% for contributions, flat 15% for income in the fund. Then once you retire, in, uh, earnings are not, are not taxed at all. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, that, that tax regime is highly regressive because if you're on the top marginal tax br bracket of 45%, that's mm. a 30% that's a 30, 30 concession. But if mm -hmm. you're on the bottom tax bracket, it's not really any concession at all. Indeed, mm. they fix this one up, but if you're on the very very bottom um you, you're below paying any tax you actually had to pay more tax by having really? your income compulsively take taken and put it so on one hand you've got this and, and now and now the concessions the amount the concessions cost the federal budget is about the same as the entire age pension system itself Really, and that and that's going to take over over time. That's just going to take over. So we have this. On one hand, we have this idea that oh, you know, we have to contain costs and have to target. And on the other hand, you can like just built up this monstrosity of regressivity of literally pro. It's a pro rich um, mm -hmm. retirement income. Uh, pro-rich inheritance transfer vehicle, by the way, we have no inheritance tax, it allows them to dodge tax for their whole life and then pass it on to their kids. It, uh -huh. It's a disaster, but it's a disaster that you see when you do that kind of uh, um, um, split system. Yeah. That, Esping Anderson talks about as being really pernicious. And mm. man, this is absolute case in point. Now, unfortunately, um, you know, the Labor Party are, are very wedded to this. And, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm a member of the Labor Party and I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, <laughs> uh, uh, work for the Labor Party. But the, the, the way that this has become a almost like a article of faith that this is amazing Mm -hmm. um, when you you look at it from a social democratic perspective, and it's absolutely mm -hmm. deranged. <laughs> and, and, and 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 what's the problem? What's the problem with a universal um, um, welfare? What's the problem with a universal age pension? People will say, "Oh, we have to target it because oh, we can't we can't have people uh, uh, paying more tax." But mm -hmm. what, what is the problem with the tax? It is because it disincentivizes work. Mm -hmm. But what does, what does means testing do? A, an assets test is the same as a, as a wealth tax. And mm -hmm. it, it just blows me away because um, in, the, in the US, like there was this meltdown when Bernie Sanders proposed his 8% wealth tax, which is quite high. Yeah. Um, but but that, it started at 32 
it started at, at people with 32 million, I think, and it was only like one or two percent. But then, then for the billionaires, it got to eight percent wealth tax, and you had all these, you know, serious pundit economists going, "Oh my God, this is going to destroy capitalism as we know it. Um, it's going to kill incentives." Rah rah rah. Uh-huh. You know what? You know, you know what? If you convert, if you turn Australia's age pension um, assets test into a um, uh, an effective marginal tax rate, uh-huh. it's eight percent on middle class <laughs> Australians on something on, on like the middle. Uh, 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 I think how many part pension on 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 literally the majority. If you include, um, if you include. If you include both people kicked off the pension and people on a part pension, means tested, kind of tapered, withdrawn down. Mm-hmm. That's the majority of senior uh, of retired Australians have been subjected to this eight percent wealth tax. And you know, it, it's it, it just from you know even setting aside like my social democratic commitments or asking and that's just deranged. That's like that's insane. Yeah, like that, absolutely. That's an insane model. I, I think, yeah, it's, it's, I, and, and I, I guess in, just to speaking on like the North American system and if, if, if Australia is like slated to kind of move towards this equilibrium of being more of a liberal regime, we, we, we make these asset tests for like the most, you know, like the weakest groups in society. So you look at like where the asset tests are the hardest, it's for like disability payments. These are people that yes. are like paying yes. through their teeth. It, it's, Absolutely insane. I, th- I think you've seen this, but uh, there's, yes. there's a threat on like, you know, like what income doesn't count, what assets are you allowed to have? Oh, like, yes. Why are we, why are we asset testing the most, like the, the people that need welfare the most? This is like tra- entrapping them in poverty when we should really be trying to uplift it. And this is just like, it, it's absolutely insane to me. Uh, yeah, well, I, this is, know. I mean, it's another thing. Australia has this uh, a liquid assets test, which is on things uh-huh. like the unemployment benefit, probably the disability benefit. It's like if you have $5,000, you, you have to have this waiting period before you can get a benefit. It's like $5,000, that's uh, 5000 Australian dollars as well, which is less than um, US and Canadian dollars. But, yeah just ridiculous and and people just lose their minds about moderate taxation elsewhere Mm -hmm. it's a real problem but i you know what i will say is i i i do you know the idea that universal is universalism is a system and that you have to um you have to draw hard lines around universality or it'll just fall over I, I, when I look at the Australian experience, I think that is basically, I think there's a lot of evidence for that. Um, for example, um, and, and I'm surprised I don't, I don't see this talked about um, very much, but you, you know, the issue of bracket creep in terms of tax, right? When if the tax bracket isn't, uh, indexed against prices or wages or indexed against something, eventually more and more people are going to pay more and more tax. Yeah. And by the way, I think that's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like tax bracket creep. Um, it, it is very slightly regressive, but as we know, uh, a, you know, that, that's not a big deal if there's a whole lot more tax and welfare going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but all those same things, if you don't have a universal system, come into play on the welfare side because you've got to set up um, welfare brackets, and there, you know, where you know the threshold at which point you're gonna your assets or your income are gonna start being tested, mm-hmm. and that in Australia the power of welfare bracket creep has massively unwound the welfare state. For example, um, in terms of child benefits, which were universal, we had a system of universal child benefits from beginning in 1941 for second children and then for all children from 1950. And that went all the way to the Labor government 
again in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And the Labor government did something, um, did on one hand, something that was really fantastic, which is massively increase the level. And the following Conservative government also increased the generosity of the system. And at during around the, I think around the 2005 point, we were at the top of the OECD in terms of um, child benefit systems, child mm -hmm. benefit payments. So that is one thing Labor um, Australia has done pretty well on. But in, in the 80s, there was this fateful decision made to sharply increase the level of payment. Mm -hmm while also means testing it. Now, immediately, it was, it drastically reduced child poverty, which mm. is you know, amazing. I think, yeah. I think the estimate is it reduced child poverty by uh, circa 50%, mm. just by this higher rate. That's but incredible. once you introduce that, that, that means test has been toxic because um, it, it went from universal coverage in 80 83 to mm -hmm. now it's just been dwindling and dwindling as um uh, as uh in, uh, due to bracket creep and also whenever a government wants a little saving they think no one will notice they'll just freeze the threshold or they'll or they'll uh slow the rate of indexation now mm -hmm. it covers only about half of kids yes um there's a there's there's a little bit of variation depending on you how you measure it. I think I think it's somewhere around half to sixty percent. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at the forecasts for the uh, the long run forecasts of the budget, uh, the intergenerational documents the Treasury prepares, it's for it's forecast to absolutely tank to dwindle into a minor program. Um, because, because um, incomes will just rise too too fast, and I do think there is this big distinction where you say this is just universal boom, everyone gets it, mm -hmm. and that is easy to monitor. That is very you know that's a very salient concept to people. You notice if the government is messing around with that, and you can build a constituency around that, where it's this slow death by indexation. And mm -hmm. it, it, the exact the exact same thing, and, and I, have a, I have a blog post exploring these issues, the exact same thing happened to the age pensions asset test. Like, everyone talks up how great it is that ever, you know, middle class families have built this um, private wealth and this has pushed them over the age pension assets test so now they can't get the pension anymore a lot of it is actually just in the, it's bracket creep and but no one talks about that that is totally absent from the discourse but it is a it is a, a large part of it if you crunch the numbers mm -hmm. um and so and then it it just it all these now, like so many, so many families don't get the family tax benefit anymore. Anymore, why do they give a shit about that? Why do they mm -hmm. give a shit about that? Um, so many people don't get the age pension anymore. It's as it dwindles and dwindles. It's going to be a harder program to mm -hmm. maintain. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I find it it's interesting because. The conservative um, government of John Howard, who was in from about 1997 to mm -hmm. um, 1996 to 2007, um, he was he was not a, I mean, he was an iconic conservative on some things, but on a lot of kind of social and economic policy issues, he was a little bit of the kind of big government conservative, a bit of a Mitt Romney in terms of the child. He, he mm -hmm. actually, you know, was quite generous on the family payments and liberalised the liberalised the means test during that period. Like it's flipped the other way again since. Um, and a lot of commentators at the time 
was saying that that was his secret weapon. That was his secret weapon as a conservative was uh, creating these broad constituencies behind them by of families by increasing these payments. He also increased also liberalised the uh, age pension asset test a bit. Um, so you know, I, I do think there is a, a, a political. The, if you want to sustain a, politi- a welfare state, there is there is a power in universality. And, and mm. another thing, another thing that we see the child benefits once you abandon the principle of universal, where it's just like it's you're a citizen, you automatically get this. You, you mm. start, uh, you do start cre- creating like opening up the door to conditionality. Um, to the bad sort, the really bad sort of conditionality, and which maybe on some level redeems Esping Anderson's point that like one leads to the other, because you know now there even is um, conditionality on the child benefit. Like you know, it's probably on some level, you know, defend defensible on some level, which is like they've got to have their vaccines or whatever to get the full right. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, like where does that end once you establish you've got to you know be a good virtuous citizen in in order to get a welfare payment um you know and especially as it dwindles more and more and as it goes from the 50th percentile down to the 20th fifth percentile say when now you're you're targeting it's only a payment that goes to the bottom i do believe you will see more things like work requirements Mm -hmm. um um, uh, um, onerous conditions like requiring uh, people to, um, you know, do you know, uh, be good parents or whatever, and and, yeah. and I think it just just intuitively, like look, uh, those those programs did to me in my mind start to go into a bit of this is dramatic language over dramatic a death spiral it's not a death spiral i mean they've they've, they've sustained but they're in decline they're in long-term structural decline Mm. once you started introducing those means tests and 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 look at the look at the programs that are been successful like us has had the us has had the most um nasty anti-welfare movement of of any of any at least need of any, country, of any yeah. country that I know of yeah. just absolute hostility and they tried I mean they tried to take on social security they yeah. tried they hard for years and years and years even even Democrats even at one point expressed interest in current president yeah um in terms of privatizing and reducing debt they just couldn't once you establish that universality, I, I, I even the most hostile systems, it becomes harder to challenge it. Um, mm-hmm. and, and especially because yeah. it's so effective, because right? I think it's like, I think for social uh, security, uh, you know, old age insurance, I think it pulls out like 38% of like old people out of poverty just through social insurance. It's like, it's, it's a wildly mm-hmm. Yep. successful program that uh has a, a lot of and you know these this the voting block is you know one of the most uh essential in america you can't lose the vote of the retirees because these are the people that come out and vote constantly and over time uh, the cutting social security is, is uh would be like a death now or privatizing it even worse would be uh just spell all kinds of trouble so yeah you're right when you build like a long-lasting program um it makes it harder over time to cut down but it's also i guess it's, it's this kind of like like loop where we need to foster some level of love for taxation so we can build a universal program, but to, but we're, we're never yeah. able to do that. And we're just stuck in this yes. kind of insidious decline of the welfare state while, you know, being in Australia's case, being kind of opposed to, okay, let's, you know, we can you know, broaden the, broaden the tax base. We can increase taxes on people a little bit. We can int- increase the redistributive budget. We can build a better program and then it'll become a good feedback loop, but we just never get to that point ever. And it's just, it's just, it, it, it's like even being in Canada, you know, this is the same thing that I see. This like hostility to taxation that just is like undercuts any kind of policy that people want to propose. Yes. And it's, it's absolutely, it's absolutely kind of infuriating. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, you know, the last labor um, 
the, the last election in Australia where Labor was expected to win and did not, and they were mm. proposing a range of taxes, um, and which was, you know, very uh, uh, gutsy for an opposition. But, um, you know, it didn't pan out. And a lot of people blame the taxes now. And, um, mm. um, you know, it, it's hard to know exactly what was that, what was the particular personality of, of the opposition leader or a whole range of factors. You know, it's possible mm. a, a very charismatic opposition leader, I, I suspect, could have carried them over. Um, but, you know, certainly there's a sense in which the taxes did hurt. And one of those, one of those um, taxes was targeting um, one of the tax... Um, uh, tightening measures was was targeting um, people who it's called franking credits uh, in, and dividend imputation in Australia um, because if if you pay if you if you if you own shares in a company and that company pays the company tax you can actually basically deduct them from your personal tax bill in Australia. It's not, it's not a very common model, but you can deduct the tax that the company paid. Now, if you, if you aren't paying much tax at all because you're, you're say, you're, you're no longer work and you're a retiree, but with a huge share portfolio, our mm. model, you actually get a tax refund. So you get a check from the government to offset the corporate tax, the company tax that that corporation paid. Um, that, <laughs> That's insane. So perversely, it's exactly. like it's like this massively regressive check. It's a check, a payment from the government welfare scheme, and Labor was clamping down on that. Uh-huh. And and it was absolutely toxic to retirees and. You know, these people are, some of them are just getting these huge payments from, from, from this scheme. But, you know, we can't have a, a, a basic aid pension to yeah. go to everyone because that would be, oh, you can, that would be regressive. Uh, and, you know, like the moment something is coded as tax concession as opposed to welfare, everyone's brain breaks and they suddenly <laughs> view it as a, I'm entitled to this versus a, well, that's nice of the government, but, you know, maybe they can cut that sort of thing. Even if it is literally a check from the government, that coding still makes a difference, which is, which is interesting. But my point of that was that the same, well, the current conservative government, not long before that, tightened the assets test which kicked off um, thousands and thousands of Australians from the age pension. I know because my dad was one. But, it, but, but they literally booted a lot of age pensioners off because they mm. said, oh, your cash assets. We don't count the home at all, which is massively distorting because especially in Sydney, you know, people might be in a $5 million home, but, you know, a, a, a few hundred thousand dollars in, in cash will destroy you. Um, and, 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 and I don't know how, but this was not a big deal. Labor couldn't. I didn't see anyone successfully capitalise on the fact that this government had kicked a lot of old people off the age pension. It just That's... blows my mind. Yeah. I mean, compare that if they tried to do that to Social Security in the US. Because as soon as you introduce this means testing and it's like, mm-hmm. well, it's not really a right. And if you, if you can afford, if you can afford it, you should be on your own feet. Once you, once you change it from being a dichotomous concept, either it's everyone or not, and introduce all this vagueness and fuzziness yeah. and complexity, it just becomes a lot harder to mobilize a constituency behind that. Yeah, this is that's insane. Cause, I mean, it's it's also like kind of doubly evil because you're th- these are like these are these are non-workers that can't you know meaningfully go back and participate in the labor market. 
And so that's just like, you know, you're right. Mm. It's deranged yes. since then. Um, yes, yes. And, and that flew to the keeper. It's like, well, they have a few thousand dollars of, a few hundred thousand dollars of assets. Yeah, yeah, well, they should be able to afford it themselves. Then you go to the tax side and these like multi, multi millionaires you know really wealthy people are getting these huge checks from the government and oh yeah that that's outrageous how can mm. how can <laughs> it's like these tax concessions are more of a social right now than welfare mm -hmm. absolutely so i guess if i were to kind of, kind of sum up the conversation that we were having today so it's it's um you know the australian kind of labor uh like the, the welfare state started off very well intentioned seemed to be one of the earliest adopters of the fact that welfare should be a right, but it was kind of marred by this uh, incessant kind of uh, uh, allegiance to means testing that is over time eroded this kind of welfare state. And, and, and now it's this on this um, insidious spiral down to what is basically, um, you know, the the American kind of welfare state. So in a, in a way, I think it like reinforces what Gil Sesame Anderson was saying, but also kind of um, is, is a counter to him because th there was a distinctive welfare state regime that was different, but it's kind of moving back to one of these three equilibriums that he set up, if, 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 if that's an accurate summary, you think? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a pretty good summary. The, the only thing is, uh, the only clarification I would make to that is mm. um, the biggest um, issue that held back the development of the welfare state in Australia was that labour didn't win. Yeah. enough and if you if you look at um the kind of i don't really see it, it as a lack of will within the labor movement mm -hmm. um and, and labor in a lot of ways were very similar to um the danish is it the um denmark labor party or denmark social democratic party my mental blank for a moment either way mm -hmm. they were if you look early on they did they were kind of going neck and neck but as Esping Anderson discussed again what happens and 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 the and the Danish were um pro means testing as well at mm -hmm. the beginning and there was a big debate about it um but what happens but once the social democratic party starts winning and winning and winning and winning then you can make those movements those kind of mm -hmm. more um luxurious models of welfare yeah um and, but you know labor labor didn't la labor didn't have that yeah la labor didn't have that luxury mm -hmm. when they were in power they were expanding them and they were expanding them in a in some ways in a social democratic direction they were moving towards a uh, more universalistic model for a little while there. Uh, but then in the 80s, when uh, Australian Labor sort of introduced what you might call neoliberalism mm -hmm. um, to Australia and, and the whole Keating government, I mean, in a way they did it in a, you know, they were, they were responding to changes in, in to globalization and change and, and there were no uh, Margaret Thatcher or um, Reagan or not even comparable to the New Zealand Labor Party who were very like quite right wing as well they yeah. they had a I mean they had a real social conscience to them and they uh, they balanced um, greater you know marketization liberalization of real progressive social reforms like the halving of child poverty mm -hmm. um but i do think they set up you know they pulled it right back to kind of the the early impulses in the model which was a hyper means testing scheme mixed with an, an added private provision in terms of superation but via the employer on top of that that it, it was it was in some ways good but very brittle and not pretty politically it, it was a it was a nice little house of cards but too politically weak to um sustain so i i i think um i think it is a somewhat of a supporting case study in the mm -hmm. supportive of esping anderson's ideas
Yeah. I mean, basically, oh, we need to keep winning elections if we want to see <laughs> see through the kind of long lasting reforms, which. Um, well, well, that's uh, I mean, that's absolutely right. Why did why did Labour have such and it, one enigma is why did Labour have such a powerful Labour movement but couldn't transfer that into government? And, mm-hmm. you know, and there are theories like it's the uh, it's that Westminster model where um, um, uh, which. Um, made it harder to um, build alliances. You know, the so- Social Democratic Party, when they were in government, was pretty much always in um, in minority governments with um, other parties, and they could get the agrarian interests in in the uh, Scandinavian model. But the the that dichotomous two party system that we have in Westminster models was not. Uh, favorable to that and the 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 actual vote of the labor party i think from i I think for something like 1900 to 1980 it was the highest primary vote of any social democratic party in the world other than the swedish um social democrats but because all the right side of politics in australia was united and it was a two-party system, they couldn't form government. So, you know, that was that political system was a barrier as well. A- another thing which I, I, I think is a... Um, once uh, Esping Anderson actually touches on is um, too much ownership in a um, settler colonial society because the, the Australian working class had mm-hmm. houses... Uh, own houses and it was very different to the feudal and this is this is a similar issue with the US and with Canada um, there was a lot of houses and land and farms and just ownership available so um, uh, um, everyone had a stake in in wealth mm-hmm. and and that was the Australian house um, was used as a bit of a substitute for a more generous retirement income scheme. And that, that's something that um, Castles uh, actually theorises as a reason why we didn't... The, the, the home ownership, because that was created a political interest to private wealth, and it and it could be used effectively as a substitute for a retirement, a more generous retirement income payment, why Australia never went that extra step in terms of, you know, that kind of luxury tier of welfare. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's a compelling story. Anyway, um, it's getting pretty late for you. So yeah, I'm yeah. Sure. It's, uh, <laughs> it's probably uh, taken up a lot of your time. No, I mean, not for, I'm not worried about me. It's 9.30, but it's, it's a half past midnight yeah, yeah. for you. So I just want to add, bring this to a close. I just want to, uh, you know, uh, just a quick question about your think tank. I'm uh, really excited uh, to hear about it. Like, uh, what, what kind of stuff do you envision doing? Yeah, well, um, first, uh, what, I, what I want to start with is creating um, a couple of short courses on Mm -hmm. the welfare state, focusing on a social democratic perspective. I I see so much, um, I think there's a real vibrancy to the movement of of young people um, online, but it's not really, it hasn't really been synthesized in a nice way. I mean, Matt, you know, Matt Brunig has done, you know, has obviously done some stuff in terms Mm -hmm. of synthesizing discrete elements Mm -hmm. like family payments, but I, I don't see it as really being brought together so mm-hmm. i I'm, i would like to do a short a couple of short courses that just um try to put it in a theoretical context from the polyani uh political economy the sb anderson sociology the uh, mm-hmm. social insurance economic theory the empirical papers about the benefits of welfare so on um one course focus a bit more on the concepts one course a bit more on the numbers Mm -hmm. and I just really like that idea to get people together and to create some sort of structure and like again like I was saying how social democrats lack these central repositories of central sources Mm -hmm. 
Uh, uh, and that's something that Three Worlds of Welfare does. Well, welfare capitalism does. I, I'd like to try to do that in terms of a short course. And yeah. I think it would be useful because it's hard to even get this stuff at universities, even mm -hmm. if they have a welfare course, it's probably not from a social democratic perspective yeah. and so on. Yeah. Maybe turn that into a book. Um, and, you know, if that pan also starting monthly podcast, if those two ventures pan out, uh, I'll, I'll go a more reg more frequent podcast and try to start up a, a social democratic think tank. Perhaps the first issue I want it, to, it'll, the, the think tank side of things will be more focused on Australia. But yeah. one of the first things I want to do is to tackle that housing question, tackle the, uh, you know, which, as we've just talked about, one of the biggest problems with entrenched private wealth undermining social democracy in Australia and in a lot of countries, Canada would be the same. Mm, absolutely. I'm, yeah, I'm really, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I, I, so I want to thank you for taking the time to come on. And um, I just, you know, I really do uh, love a lot of the blog posts that you've put out. And they've been pretty kind of pivotal in, in, in me, uh, for me in my journey uh, to, to, towards, you know, being a more of a evidence-based leftist. So, uh, so thank you for coming on, David. Uh, I really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And good, well done on this venture. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to your uh, your things I'm coming up to in your pro uh, your podcast. Uh, Thanks, mate.